Let's also make some noise for Lauren Nadig, who made the intro video we're about to see for Miss Rave. Make some noise for Lauren. She'll be receiving some swag, courtesy of Kiana here at Wentworth Con. Without further ado, here's a little intro video to get you pumped. They call me a freak. Ferguson 
is looking in the window, and Joan is looking in the window, and I think Joan looks away and Ferguson looks on. I'm not sure, but I'd like your answer to that reflection. That was actually an idea that uh, I directed Kevin Carlin, who had uh, um, directed that episode. I can't even remember where it was. Maybe series four, somewhere around there. Um, but certainly, they they played a lot with the notion of that Joan uh, had a. a, a, a another side of herself that she wasn't really in touch with, but she was quite, getting quite fascinated by through several of the storylines that went through this, in, in the series. But that particular one, Kev just said one day, I would just love that thing where that she's staring at her own reflection, looking and trying to understand, trying to know what to do, and that she would turn away and that reflection would stay staring at her. I think they created such a complex character who obviously was, uh, did a lot of, Hello, Cheryl. <laughs> we did a lot of, Cheryl was in Sydney last week. Um, well, um, that uh, that uh, she, she, although she was capable of some pretty um, extraordinary monstrous things, um, that there was a complexity that sat underneath her that she wasn't all bad, you know, she wasn't just a moustache twirling villain. She had <laughs> nuanced uh, qualities and perhaps that there was a, uh, there was a something deep and um, that she disconnected from that also had a potential for good and that she was fascinated by it, so she was constantly examining herself. Thank you. Thank you. Over here, first question on the left. Thanks for that. Hi. Hi. I love you. <laughs> um, my name is Garce. I'm from Hampton, Indiana. Garce or Garce? Garce with the G. Hi, Garce. Oh, you said my name. Oh. <laughs> Okay. I'm part of your fabulous red right hand. Red right hand. I've just been inducted into the club. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, just, I just wanted to ask you, what was your most memorable scene working on Whitmer? I, that's, that's such a hard one to answer. Actually, I, you'd probably be better at answering what your favorite scenes are. And um, I, mean, I loved working on many of them. Um, I had such a great, uh, I mean, I, I could think of favorites or special scenes with almost every one of the other cast members. If I had to pick one, <laughs> that wouldn't be it. Um, the terrible thing about that, I don't know if you remember what they were talking about the pencil throwing, and is that yeah. I had to pick up um, a, a bunch of pencils and throw them at a glass window with a camera on the other side. And uh, as we, the director was saying, could you do this? Could you sort of hit that back? And the, and the camera will line up the camera there. And I went, what, you mean like this? And just went, and it was perfect. It was absolutely <laughs> But the camera wasn't set up yet. <laughs> And I couldn't have I mean, you could see there's a goof reel there when I do it. I must have done it like 25 times. <laughs> no, so not that scene. Uh, I would say probably, um, I, I don't know, in the end, when you asked that question, the first thing that came to mind um, would be some of the yard scenes, just because unlike a lot of American shows, the budgets are about one-tenth of, you know, or one one-hundredth of Game of Thrones. <laughs> Per episode, and so um, there's a lot of highly skilled, very accomplished people who are working very, very fast to pull off some technically very difficult things and make them look good, uh, the quality television that they want um, this to be. And so people have to work really, really efficiently. And so when there were big group scenes like I, the big fight scene where I took down Abby. everybody. <laughs> That was a lot of fun. It was hard work because we had to work so fast, but there was something about the adrenaline having to do that really quickly and having a huge team of people working um, uh, simpatico, working together well, um, efficiently, uh, at a real level of excellence. That was very exciting. Also, to be honest, as much as I hated doing that scene, the hanging, the lynching scene, oh. it was an extraordinary day. It was an extraordinary day at work. <laughs> <laughs> And I needed a very stiff drink at the end of it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, over here on the right, what's your name and where are you from? Hi, I'm Paige and I'm from Oklahoma. Um, my question, Daddy, is I mean, Pamela. <laughs> Oh, 
freaky tits. <laughs> okay, if Paige have to ask me that again, I just turn my, turn my mic off. Yeah. You did the same? <laughs> Mommy, yeah. Do I ship freaky ticks? Hell yes. Absolutely. I mean, yes, of course. I mean, on the moment I saw, uh, I mean, and, and Kate Atkinson, who's a dear, dear friend, and we enjoy working together a, a lot. Um, uh, the moment we read that scene that, the, that they put John Ferguson and Vera Bennett together having that drink after work, and we knew that, um, and that first day we worked together, we knew that there was a, uh, going to be a kind of complex, nuanced relationship between those two women that um, particularly Joan wasn't really in touch with, but that was there, and, and, they, and certainly the writers saw it and knew that there was something to work with there, but um, I think they're a great couple. I Next one down here on the left. Hi, my name is Sierra, I'm from Maryland, I drove Hello, Sierra from Maryland. Hi. Congratulations on the drive. I'm going to stay within the speed limit. Wait, so I'm an up and coming actress, film producer, and DJ. So, my question for you that is, is no matter how many times I get up in front of people like talking to you now, I'm nervous. So, my question is, like, what do you do with your nerves? Like, how do you get rid of them? I don't know how to answer that question because it's, um, it's a tricky thing I, that I'm actually probably, I mean, some of it's just genetics. You know, I come, I, I'm more nervous probably sitting across a table speaking to one person than I am speaking to a thousand people. And, 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 the, and the fact that I do a lot of um, live performance and stuff like that, I'm, I'm, I'm used to it. Um, whatever the kind of fear that gives you, that makes you choke and that, doesn't kind of occur to me so much anymore. Or maybe that is practice, I don't know what it is, but I think it's just also in your DNA. But there is another thing, which is something about, um, I remember one of the first jobs that I ever had was as a red velvet escort, which is not much of you. <laughs> but it, it was a travel guide on a, um, on a bus tours around Vancouver, which is where I... Woo! <laughs> um, um, spent most of my kind of teenage years. And I was a terrible red velvet escort until two weeks before I finished the job, I got accepted into acting school. I was 19 years old. And, uh, and the last two weeks of the job, I suddenly got much better. And there were two things that I think I realized. One was that um, I didn't need it. And so I, you know, it's about knowing what you want and what's important to you but at the same time not letting that become so important that you don't keep the, the important things in life at, at, at the kind of, at, at the pinnacle of your desires uh, so that you can be free just to be you. But the other part of it too was that I realized that there was a kind of a character that a red velvet escort was. And once I knew who that character was, I didn't feel so exposed. And maybe that's just a kind of complex, psychology behind why people become actors and performers. I don't think I'm hiding behind it or anything, but I find a release through the character that does those things. So it's finding your DJ, producer, writer, and going, this is who I am, and I'm born to do this thing. Amen. And then suddenly, as long as you keep breathing, it just <laughs> Between Freak and Bridget Westfall. And what was your favorite scene with Libby Tanner? Yeah. Oh, I love Libby Tanner. Immediately when you say that, I think there was a wonderful day where we shot. Um, uh, it was. Mm? Fire. <laughs> no, it was the scene where uh, Joan had come back into the prison and uh, I was sent to have an interview. To yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And there was a surveillance camera above and, and, and where, um, um, am I allowed to swear in this room? Yes! Yes! yes. yes. Where, Bridget, where Bridget said, you really are a cunt. Yes! <laughs> oh. <laughs> Can 
apologies for the offense. Hello, my name is Michelle. Um, I'm from the state of Georgia. Hello, Michelle from Georgia. Thank you. First and foremost, thank you for coming up to see us. And also, thank you for such an intimate experience. Oh, great. <laughs> in the States to have such an intimate experience oh, really? with people um, who we see on the stage for people that we have been watching for years. You've played a variety of characters from um, In the Well all the way to fucking out. So uh, my question is, is there any special projects you're working on right now that we can look forward to seeing you in the future? Oh yeah. Oh, what what you yeah. Back to what? You're not dead! Just knowing that, I mean, as I said, there was Cheryl that I just saw that, that, uh, that I know that some of you probably here, I would have seen in the last couple of weeks in Sydney, that, um, so I, I can mention some of my theatre projects, but they would mean nothing to most of you, because you're not coming to Australia, but I wish you would. I, great. Australia is a wonderful place to visit. Um, and the theatre is pretty I'm directing a play for the Melbourne Theatre Company, coming up shortly. Um, Photograph 51, which is about Rosalind Franklin, who's it's one of the forgotten titans of uh, history, who um, was uh, instrumental in the discovery of DNA. It's a beautiful little play. Um, and I've got a, a couple other projects in the boil. I'll certainly be watching Wentworth. Will you and, be coming uh, back? Come back. Uh, Come back! Please don't be dead! Come back! I'm also developing another thing, a dance piece as well, that's the thing. Come back from the dead! Please, please. Yeah, don't get them started. Don't tease them with a dance. Okay, no, no, no. We'll make you do it. Next question over here. Hi, Pamela. Um, I'm. Not my name. <laughs> I, I do that all the time. I'm Kyla from Brooklyn, New York. Kyla. 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 Hi, Kyla. Hi. Um, so my question is: Do you often find that people are like? completely terrified of you because of your own life. Oddly enough, men more than women. Uh, but generally not too much. Yeah, there's been some times, but I, I would hope to think that once they've had about 10 seconds of interaction, they're okay and realize that I'm, I'm not going to do anything to them. <laughs> no, it's been pretty good. I'll tell you what I find really wonderful. I mean, I'm mostly a theatre actor, and when you do theatre, um, you know, people see you from a distance, and generally you might have a wig on and a costume and a strong character, and they don't recognise you on the street. I take public transport, it's all fine. Um, and I'm used to that, I've been used to that for years. But that when you do television and you're in people's lounge rooms and people develop a very invested and intimate relationship, often with the characters, um, that interaction when they finally see them in public can be a bit different, and I've witnessed that, uh, you know, with people where, <laughs> you know, where somebody will be on a footpath and I'll be walking with an actor who's on a high-profile show, and there's people, it's what I call a sphincter drop. <laughs> where all, every muscle in their body just goes... <laughs> And then they end up usually screaming something inarticulate, often the character's name. <laughs> and what I find different, I mean, just a couple of times, I've had a, once in the UK where I had a, a group of teenage girls across the room screaming freak at me, but um, <laughs> and then once again in this room, but that was kind of it was different. It was nice. uh, but they generally speak, people who watch went with her, I, I find extraordinarily. Um, respectful, they often know our names as performers and they're able to see the difference between the actor and the character that they're playing. And I think that's pretty special and speaks to the quality of the fans. Yeah. 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 Next question over here. Hi. Hi. My name is Emily. I'm from New Jersey. Hi, yeah. Emily. From yeah. <laughs> 
going to ask you about Joan and Vera because I would have loved to see Joan happy in a good relationship with a woman. I feel like she would have been, I don't know, able to live a relatively normal life if that had happened. But anyway, I'll ask you a different question. Going along the theater uh, question route, um, I know that you've never done a Broadway show over here, so I'm wondering what show would it be that would bring you here? Oh, yes. <laughs> If I knew, I'd be writing a letter to somebody. But, uh, <laughs> uh, And there would be a nice sort of synchronicity or whatever, not synchronicity, that's the wrong word, but sort of symmetry to the fact that in Australia, uh, Maggie Kirkpatrick, who played the original John Ferguson, was a very memorable and memorable. Yeah. Yeah. This one over here. Hi, my name is Mia. I'm from Philly, Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, it hurts. Um, would you be able to survive in a woman's prison yourself? <laughs> Well, I mean, there's, there's so many hypotheticals in there because, I mean, I'm assuming that if I did something that would get me into a woman's prison, I, I might be a slightly different person with a different set of <laughs> life skills. Um, but, um, uh, I mean, it's one of the privileges and the challenges of performing in a show like this that, we, you know, and, and because there's a real um, uh, attempt to capture the the kind of stakes and the realities of what it might be like to be in a woman's prison within a dramatic fictional context. But uh, that it, I feel lucky that I can um, check out and leave that at the end of every day. You know, I just can't imagine what the circumstances would be, you know. And, and also, I mean, that, it's one of the major themes of the show that I remember that Kevin Carlin phoned me when I was approached uh, and asked if I was interested in playing John Ferguson. And he was telling me what he felt the show was about, and he said one of the main themes in it is that um, you know nobody leaves that system unscathed. I mean, the cost on everyone, whatever side of the bars they're on, is huge, and that's actually a major kind of theme for the show that continues uh, even now as they're just about to launch into shooting season eight. <laughs> Next one down here on the left. We're gonna keep banging these out, so stay online. We'll see how many we can get through. Go ahead. Hi, Hi Pamela. Hi. My name is Iman. I'm from Florida. Hi, Iman. Woo! Florida! Um, I kind of have like two questions at once. You can either pick one or answer both. Okay. Um, do you okay. think having like stage work experience makes you a stronger actor? Um, and also, my second question was, um, would you have any advice for any young people that are like breaking into the business, such as like, <laughs> writing scripts or directing a play, because I kind of just started writing one myself, and I thought you, I wanted to know if you had any advice for me. That's tricky, great, good on you. I think the only kind of advice I have about, um, you know, following a creative path is that you will, that it is the hardest road, and um, you need to need to do it. If at any point you wake up and say, this isn't satisfying me or making me happy, Go find something else that does because it's just you need to you need to be able to you need to not be able to do anything else right. you know, to be able to ride the highs and lows of all that. Um, uh, I, I think that um, the answer to your first part of your question is really kind of what I talked about before about being a red velvet travel escort. Is that <laughs> in a way it's the the theatre work that I've done, the, the working I've done, and I've always. Um, said yes to things. One of the reasons why I've done very little screen work is that theatre work tends to be organised a year, two years in advance. People are asking you about whether you want to be involved in uh, live performance production. But that it means that I've been employed relatively constantly and you get better by doing it. You can become a better writer by writing. Uh, and you know, and, and if nobody responds to that first one but you've still got the stories in you, just keep on writing. Keep on doing it. Somebody will, somebody will see it. You need to do it. You know, it'll happen, and you will get better. And that's um, 
So that's the one gift that theatre has brought to me many years, just um, by practice, by doing, it's given me, and, and then the affirmation that you get just gives you more confidence. I found the character that, um, that enjoys that kind of play. So. And I've been lucky. Luck's a big part of it, but luck has to meet the preparation and the inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. My question was, how much of a say did you have in some of Joan's backstory? Because obviously some of it was different from the Prisoner series. I was wondering, did you have much of a say with that, or was that purely the writers? Um, uh, not really backstory. That's all producers and writers that control that sort of stuff. I might have occasionally make comments on things that I got excited by, and then they would develop those things. So, um, uh, like, there was just one little tiny moment in the very first scripts that I were given in the, in the beginning of season two where Joan um, washed her hands with a bit of a, a antibacterial thing. And I, I kind of, well, I suppose Joan's OCD met my OCD. <laughs> and and um, I went, oh, this is great, that's fabulous. And, and uh, I mean, and they also noted that not only the stuff of the antibacterial soap is that even me as an actor, when I was playing the governor, and I would sit at that desk and would often shoot all the governor's scenes on one day, just bang them up one after another. So I'd have a lot of different actors sitting in the chair opposite me, and when they'd leave, I would just see all the grubby finger marks. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than have a props guy be dealing with it, I was constantly reaching into my drawer to my microfiber cloth. And, <laughs> and some of that actually made its way in. So it's not really backstory, but character detail, yes, they were very open to that. And then also sometimes, I mean, there's a few, like even put the kettle on was yeah. my response to that, that line, you know, when you know that. that they occasionally, once, once a show is up and running, that kind of all the gems that the writing department give you start to kind of intermingle with your own inspiration and and we all start to kind of um, cook together and they were often very generously open to us, much more than many other television shows I, I found out, to um, the occasional writer's door was often open and we could have conversations about things and they would listen to our suggestions and then ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Next one over here. Hi, uh, Amanda from Jersey. Hello. Uh, Ferguson's character was who she was because of you, you're playing her. Uh, uh, if anybody else played her, I don't think she would have been the same. But if you had a chance to play any other character, who would you pick and why? In, in Wentworth? Wentworth or otherwise. Oh, uh, oh otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to be, um, I want to be Bill and Al's aunt. Oh, thank you. Uh, next one over here, we're trying to get to two more on each side if we can. If we can make them quick. So. Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle, and I'm from North Carolina. I saw an interview with you where you stood up. You said you stood up in front of the whole cast at like your first table reading and apologize to everyone for what your character was going to have to do to them later. So my question is, how did you feel when Ferguson had to kill Queen Bee? Oh. <laughs> I had a lot of apologizing to almost every one of the cast members. But I, I, well, I mean, that was an extraordinary thing because none of us knew that was so, I'd say, secret squirrel. I don't know if that's a phrase that you're familiar with, but that we were not t even told until literally a week before. And even when the schedules were coming out, there was nothing, no detail about what was going to happen. So um, I think we were all in a kind of state of shock. And um, but we, I kind of suspected somebody was going to go, and I didn't know whether it was me or whether it was Danielle or you know B or Ferguson or what. Um, but, as you do, as a professional actor, you go, this is going to be an extraordinary television moment, let's get down and try to make it as wonderful and, and as we can. And luckily, Kev Carlin, who's the director that I've mentioned his name several times, there's a great 
stable of directors who work on this show, but um, Kevin is often um, bestowed uh, with um, opening and closing episodes, and we were in very good hands with Kev. Um, we have great rapport, and Danielle and I spoke a lot about what we were trying to achieve in that heart, I and mean, it was very, very detailed in terms of the ambiguity that was built into it. You know, was it B. Smith who was driving that thing in order to frame Ferguson? Was Ferguson's own nature being tapped and something was triggered in her that she could not control? And being a character who's so obsessed with control that there was, you know, that there was so much nuanced detail about the way we discussed it, played it, and then how it was captured and then how it was edited. So there was a lot of conversation around it. Um, uh, I, I, but it, it was the job that we were asked to do, and I hope we did it okay. Yeah. It's always hard, it's always hard. I mean, it's the wonderful thing about a prison context is that we all know that the prison is the main character, and people come in, and people stay, and people go. People are released into freedom, or people are killed. People, you know, do not survive the experience. And so any of And buried alive. Any of those possibilities are on the table when you say yes to that job. So. Over here. Hi Pamela. My name's Marlena from New Jersey. Hi, Marlena. Yeah, you're good. Yes. <laughs> My question is like first of all, you are gotta be the most badass villain. Yeah. Woo! Yes. Yes. Like how deep and dark do you have to go to be able to play that character. Oh, right. <laughs> 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 probably not as deep as I should feel. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a hard one because villains are always really delicious to play because they're usually really complex, you know, just happy good people are often a little dull. And um, <laughs> unfortunately, nice in life, but not necessarily in, uh, in drama. Um, but, but I was always aware quite often that some of the things that we were asked to do as actors, um, and particularly some of the nefarious deeds that John Ferguson got up to, or it was even subjected to, that it was often more, even more stressful for the crew or the other actors and extras in the scene witnessing things. It, that, that was really distressing, probably because they're better people than I am. But also, <laughs> I'm in the middle of doing, of doing the job and trying to do it to the best of my ability and to serve the story well. And I'm often given great and interesting things to do. I mean, that scene of climbing up on top of Juicy Lucy to um, <laughs> uh, give her a visit to the dentist that she'll never forget that, um, <laughs> was actually really, really interesting to work out, technically to do, um, and uh, again, the directors and the writers were very generous to me in, some, in listening to some of the suggestions that, that I had. Originally, there was a whole different music thing going on, and I said, I think John would put classical music on, and that's where that Tales of Hobbit stuff came from. And so we, you know, it became a ballet, and I get, so I become quite like Joan, disconnected from, you know, the more traumatizing and dis disgusting aspects of what, of what the acts that she's doing. And it's the people watching who get incredibly upset. I mean, poor Robbie Magaziva. I'm sure you were aware that, that, that in the scene that followed that scene with Juicy Lucy in the tongue, um, Juicy Lucy had to go out to the yard covered in the, well, mm -hmm. the evidence of what had just happened. And poor little Robbie nearly lost his lunch. Because <laughs> he's such a good man. <laughs> Uh, we're going to only have time for one more question, guys. Sorry, I'm sorry over there. Uh, so it's going to be this last one over on the right. Uh, hi, Pamela. I'm Melody from Queens, New York. Hello, Ooh. Melody from Queens. Yes. First, I want to say you are such a talented actress. Yeah. Um, you played John Ferguson with yeah. such composure and skills. You made her a character that we love to hate and hate to love. So thank you so much for that. Yes. The question I have that I was thinking is, if there was a change in the storyline and Joan was still around in Wentworth, yes. what type of situations or ending would you see for her different than how it portrayed it in the show? <laughs> I don't think I can answer that question, but I suspect you can. So. <laughs> 
I don't, I don't even know how to ask that. That's a question for the writers, really. Yeah. No, I don't know. I, it has been such a privilege to be involved with this show. I came on, the character arrived in the beginning of the second season, but already the um, first season had just completed filming but hadn't been released to the public, and I remember running into Chris McQuaid by Jax Holt in the first uh -huh. season, yeah. uh, who's a friend who I've never worked with, but I ran into her on the street and she was saying um, that she just finished shooting this first season and she said, it's a good one, it's a good one. And then a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call asking if I'd be interested in John Ferguson. And I, I have said this in interviews before, so it's probably not news to you, but I just, I just put the phone down. I went, <laughs> <laughs> because I, it was a combination of knowing that it had the seal of approval from some actors that I really respect and admire, and that's an unusual thing, and uh, but also knowing that it was uh, going to be a corker of a ride. And, uh, <laughs> it is a great show. Thank you for giving us a point on the panel. We appreciate it. Once again, give it up for Pamela one more 